This is the west coast of Canada, a brilliant, rugged, and wild. 965 kilometers stretch from the Juan de Fuca Strait all the way to Dixon Entrance, Haida Gwaii. Over 4,000 islands rest along the coastline's complicated shores of deep inlets and protruding capes, all of which are coated in a lush green forest of skyscraping conifers and a carpet of ferns, soaked in an excessive amount of rainfall. Raw Pacific waves batter the central coast, along with the west coast of Vancouver Island and the Queen Charlotte Islands, bringing with them a constant North Pacific sea breeze that keeps the coastal forest pretty much the same temperature all year round. Thousands of rivers and streams flow into the ocean, bringing with them nutrients from the forest floor, helping to create nourishing marine ecosystems. The coastline is nothing without the sea, both figuratively and literally. Our waters are what make this coastal environment so unique. Low temperatures combined with relatively shallow and nutrient-rich waters play a crucial role in our kelp forest environment. Kelp forests are perceived to be one of, if not the most, productive, vibrant, and ecologically diverse habitats on Earth. British Columbia's entire coast is a kelp forest environment, housing the ideal conditions for these forests to grow in the masses. Our cool, fast-moving waters allow bull kelp and giant kelp to thrive. Cold, nutrient-rich waters are an essential part of a kelp forest development, given that these protists require sunlight to photosynthesize. Cooler waters allow more sunlight to penetrate the euphotic zone, the clearer the water, the less light is scattered, making photosynthesis and life a lot easier. Dissolved inorganic nitrogen also decreases in warmer marine waters, which negatively affects kelp growth. Such a strong dependence on sunlight restricts these ecosystems to a depth no greater than 40 meters. Larger forests are restricted to depths even shallower due to the density of kelp in competition for sunlight. Kelp forest and beds grow on rocky sea floors in waters anywhere from 5 to 20 degrees Celsius. Upwelling regions prove to be most successful in forest growth, which is why most large kelp forests are found in channels between islands and other narrow stretches of sea, where turning tides greatly affect water movement. The fronds or blades of the kelp are photosynthetic and act just as leaves would for terrestrial plants. Cellular respiration is used to create ATP energy for the kelp, and the waste product oxygen enters the ocean water. These forests and beds are so productive because they oxygenate the water. This is one more reason why these kelp forests are such a desirable habitat for fish and invertebrates. Because kelp grow in large clusters and can reach lengths of up to 60 feet, they act as breakwaters especially in the open ocean on the west coast of Vancouver Island and the central coast, breaking the forceful surge of Pacific waves, creating regions of calm water along rugged shores that would otherwise be inhabitable by many marine organisms. An example of ocean dweller that benefits greatly from the calm, cool, highly oxygenated waters of the kelp forest would be plankton. Kelp forests are rich with both phytoplankton and zooplankton. Being drifters unable to swim against currents and tides, plankton make themselves comfortable in the calm flow of the natural breakwater. Because forests don't really grow beyond the euphotic zone, phytoplankton get all of the sunlight they need while not having to worry about being smashed against ragged weathered rocks. The abundance of phytoplankton maintains an equal abundance of zooplankton, and as you all know, many things eat zooplankton. Invertebrates from every phylum thrive under the golden canopy of the underwater forest. Let's talk about what lives in a kelp forest. It's all got to do with food when it comes down to it, and kelp takes its place at the very bottom of the trophic level. Kelp serves as a solid food source for many invertebrates, like urchins, snails, crabs, sea stars, abalone, etc. Thousands of fish live in the forest, eating the masses of resident plankton, as well as hiding and laying eggs in the foliage from predators. The abundance of fish plankton and invertebrates attract a profusion of seabirds and larger marine mammals such as sea lions, otters, dolphins, and even sometimes larger whales like gray whales. C. 
Sea otters are very important to the health of a kelp forest ecosystem. Populations of kelp consuming organisms need to be kept in check, especially those that graze on the holdfast of the algae, making dense populations of echinoderms and mollusks harmful as they tend to dislodge entire kelp strands from the sea, sea floor. Sea urchins are especially detrimental when populations are left unchecked. A herd of urchins is capable of mowing down forests at a rate of 30 feet per month. Lucky for us, sea otters maintain forest homeostasis by eating 25% of their body weight in urchins and other problem invertebrates. When we hunted these otters to the brink of extinction, kelp forests suffered greatly. The loss of this keystone species damaged the ecosystem, greatly affecting tons of species both directly and indirectly. We lost so many of our giant forest on the eastern coast of Vancouver Island. But now that the sea otter populations are on the rise again, forest health is on its way to recovery. Kelp forests are what make the BC coast so unique. If we were to lose these forests, we lose an immense amount of biodiversity. The waters are getting warmer and more acidic as we speak. The growth rate of kelp is decreasing and the disappearance of keystone species are resulting in unchecked populations of problem organisms. At the rate we're going, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to lose these vibrant ecosystems in the years to come. Our coast is one of the last remaining truly wild environments left on the planet and it is absolutely necessary that we keep it this way. BC's coast is one of the most vibrant and ecologically diverse marine ecosystems left on our planet. It may not look like much from land, but under the water's surface there is a whole foreign world living in harmony with each other, whether you care to look or not. Every organism works together and relies on one each other for survival, and it has been that way for over 700 million years. So why do we, as a species, feel the need to destroy a system that has been in perfect working order since before our ancestors could even breathe air? In the last 100 years, we have been able to threaten all of this. With so many species at risk of extinction, it's like we're pressing buttons on a cell phone we do not understand until it eventually locks us out or even resets itself. Because of our actions, hundreds of coastal animals are at risk or endangered. I would love to share them all with you, but that would take days, so I have selected a few that everyone should probably know. Let's start with the orca whale. For thousands of years, the orca whale has been the totem animal of our coast, a symbol of power, long life, unspoiled nature, freedom, and strength. The BC's coast was even home to the highest concentration of orca whales on the planet, and there are three different groups that lived here. The offshore, the resident, and the transient orca whales. Southern resident whales are disappearing, with about 80 individuals left in the three southern pods, and their populations remain threatened. Northern resident whales are becoming more silent and harder to find. Offshores are hard to find because they're, well, offshore. And transient whales are constantly piecing out, because that is what they do. They come and they go. These whales are threatened by pollution, disturbance, entanglement in nets, and threat to their food source. But orca whales are far from the only whales threatened, and here is a list. The humpback whale, sperm whale, gray whale, the blue whale, Pacific right whale, minke whales, say whales, and fin whales. So basically 10 out of the 19 whale species in our waters are endangered or at risk because of the same factors as the orca whale but they are far from the only marine mammals affected either. How about this little bundle of joy? The sea otter, once living happily in numbers over the millions before being hunted to near extinction by fur traders. Sea otters have lived on the brink of extinction on our coast for many years, but are beginning to make a remarkable comeback. It's hard for them, being the only sea mammals that do not have blubber to keep themselves warm, but instead a high metabolism that constantly burns precious calories for warmth. 
So they eat a lot, approximately 25% of their body weight in food each day. You can't find them in the Haida Gwaii, Central Coast, or Georgia Strait anymore. They are threatened because of depleted food sources, disappearance of kelp forests, poaching, and entanglement in fishing nets. Oil spills are also an immense threat to otter populations as well. When otters come into contact with oil, it causes their fur to mat and prevents them from insulating their bodies, causing them to die of hypothermia in our frigid coastal waters. Almost the same way that oil would affect seabirds, which leads us to the next topic. Triangle Island is the smallest and last island on the Scott Island archipelago, just above northern Vancouver Island, and is home to BC's largest and most diverse seabird colony, where scientists study more than one million visiting seabirds, the majority being the tuft puffin, the rhinoceros auklet, the cossin's auklet, and the common myrrh. These birds are extremely sensitive to their environment and over the past couple years, populations have been depleted because of disturbance, threat to their food source, and pollution, and fishing net entanglement. But scientists suspect more. The seabird's food web is unraveling, and global warming and overfishing are to be the culprits. All access to Triangle Island has been restricted in an attempt to protect these seabirds, but good luck getting there in the first place. How would global warming be the culprit? Well, many sea animals rely on plankton to survive, but global warming causes warmer water to bring with it different zooplankton communities that thrive in that environment. Warm water zooplankton are smaller, in fewer numbers, and not as nutritious, while our resident cold water zooplankton is much larger, more numerous, and very nutritious. It's not surprising that with our new warm water plankton acting as a weak, unstable foundation for our marine food chain, that the food web would be unraveling. With weak plankton brings weak fish, and with weak fish brings a weak ecosystem. This is one of the many factors causing the marine food web to unwind. Plankton being one of the keystone species in the marine ecosystem leads me to talk of another, one of the most important keystone species here on the coast, the Pacific Salmon. Chinook, coho, chum, pink, and sockeye are extremely important keystone species because they are a vital food source to both land and aquatic wildlife, including and not limited to orca whales, bears, seals, otters, sea lions, coastal dolphins, birds of prey, and us. Pacific salmon enrich terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems with essential marine-based nutrients when they complete their life cycles. They are economically and culturally important around the world. Their populations suffer because of climate change, deforestation, wildlife trade, oil and gas development, overfishing, illegal fishing, pollution, soil erosion of river mouths, infrastructure, and water scarcity. No wonder all Pacific salmon species are endangered. Salmon aren't the only fish species to face endangerment. They have rockfish to accompany them. Rockfish are an important part of BC's coastal marine ecosystem because they are a food for many marine creatures like seals, sea lions, and larger fish like lingcod. Rockfish need very specific conditions to make it through their first few years. There's only been a few years in the last century where rockfish have survived in any great number. They are also keep the ecosystem in balance by feeding on smaller creatures like prawns, crabs, and other small fish. Rockfish have become threatened due to human activity, such as overfishing, caught unintentionally by fishermen, targeting other species, duration of their habitat, infrastructure, and pollution. And for our final and most endangered marine animal, we have the northern abalone. Abalone can spend their entire lives within a pond-sized patch on the ocean floor at only about 18 meters deep making them an easy target for predators, and more importantly, poachers. Abalone have been hunted and poached to the brink of extinction. They are collected for their beautiful shells, high demand on the Asian market, and being a sought after delicacy in many parts of the world. Abalone have been a protected species for many years, but even being protected, abalone have a hard time reproducing, even if they were plentiful. The abalone's biggest threat is human poachers also being the prey of sea stars and moon snails, plus the occasional sea otter. But with many new factors, like warmer waters and acidic oceans, abalone will have a harder time finding enough food, 
or building up its beautiful shell. It is estimated that in the next 30 to 50 years, northern abalone will become extinct from our west coast forever. BC's coast is one of the healthiest remaining marine habitats and is home to many unique plants and animals. This area is known as the Pacific North Coast Integrated Management Area, or the Panissima. It reaches from Alert Bay to the northern tip of the Queen Charlotte Islands and acts as a conservation area for many marine species and their homes. It may seem like this area is doing well, but lots of people don't realize that we are having a huge impact on this coast and not in a good way. Oil tankers already travel on the outside of Vancouver Island and along the Georgia Strait, with chance of collision and spills. But what would happen if these tankers were allowed inside the Panissima? The abridged pipeline would make it so that super tankers would have to navigate through channels, twists, and turns, treacherous to even a pleasure craft, let alone a quarter of a mile super tanker. The abridged pipeline project would bring two to three oil tankers a week, and at a pipeline flow rate of 4,000 barrels per day, BC's coast could expect to spill greater than 1,000 barrels every six years, and a large spill of 10,000 barrels every 16 years. Oil spills are inevitable, so the true question is not if, but when and how much. Remember the Exxon Valdez disaster in Alaska 27 years ago? When a tanker hit a well-known reef and spilled 11 million gallons of crude oil over the Prince William Sound, killing otters, eagles, seals, quarter million seabirds, and orca whales, here is what the first remediation expert says on scene and she had to say about what she saw. We were so overcome by the smell of death and the smell of the crew that we began to vomit uncontrollably. And we ran desperately, like from a fire into the forest, um, to, to try and get our bearings. And uh, we had to put our respirators on to go back. Imagine what having to wear a respirator walking along the beach here. That's what you'll face. And uh, that was just day three, and it hadn't really gotten as far as it got. Um, and uh, I remember going back out there now with my respirator on, and I'm, I was, I'm one of the best green remediation experts in the world, hey, I'm young, fit, and uh, I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. We were supposed to fix it, right? And uh, I remember I had to go back into the woods and take my respirator off, and I, uh, I saw for hours because uh, I didn't know how to fix it. I had all the technology in the world, that someone was going to give us a billion dollars, and uh, we didn't know how to fix it. The inside passage is supposed to be a tanker-free zone, and the Canadian Shipping Act itself says, no person shall transport oil in a tanker in the areas of sea adjacent to the coast of Canada, known as the Dixon's Entrance, Hecate Strait, and Queen Charlotte Sound. Pat Daniel, the CEO of Enbridge, even said himself, can we promise there will never be an accident? No, nobody can. An oil spill would devastate this coast. To our fragile kelp forest ecosystems, the important food sources like salmon, to our beautiful majestic sea mammals, and the coastline. And most importantly, to our coastal communities. What then? Salmon is one of the most important marine species that thrive on the BC coast. Not only do people catch them for food, but many other animals rely on salmon as the main factor in their diets. The difference between humans and these animals is we have started to farm these fish. And we do not take into mind what is happening in the areas around it. The salmon we are farming, Atlantic salmon, are not native to the area, and if they escape from their farms, they will outcompete the other native salmon for food. The salmon that remain in the farms are farmed in open net pins, which allow for disease, infection, and parasites to be transferred to the wild stocks. And because of this, the fish are often treated with antibiotics to combat disease, which also spills out into the surrounding life. The exposure to antibiotics leads toward antibiotic resistance. For example, splice. Slice is a food fed to the fish that supposedly fights off sea lice. But reports of slice resistance are coming from Europe and South America, 
that are reporting stronger sea lice with the slice resistance. To make it worse, slice isn't even licensed in Canada because it is basically a neurotoxin. It is used and a, I quote, approximately only for limited use on a case-to-case -case basis on the Canadian Emergency Release Program. Fish farmers have been reporting strange tumors and excessive amounts of parasites on ground fish around the farms. Researchers have consistently reported that over 80% of the juvenile wild salmon have a lethal load of sea lice by the end of May, further proving the effects we are having on the environment. To add the final nail to the coffin, fish farms in BC coast are primarily owned by companies outside of Canada, like Marine Harvest. There are many other problems that need to be addressed, but these are the main ones that I feel are the most important and the easiest to tackle first. We gotta start somewhere, so why not start here? Thank you.